Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to The Property Couch. And Ben, for the third or fourth week since the new intro, welcome yes. back to you as well. Well, thanks for having me back on, Bryce. <laughs> you're Every welcome. week I don't know whether you're going to you know, get me off the bench and bring me into it's the like game. The, it's like Thursday night yeah. seeing if you're just, made... I'm just like you know the sixth player on basketball just trying to get on the court. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> you, just keep, you just keep working hard and I'll continue to pick yeah. you, all right? <laughs> very um, good. Hey, excited today. We've got a very special guest. Yes. In fact, we're going to go inside mm. the... The the um, the property boom, yeah, the, in, the, of of the, of the it, mining town. Correct. Well, I was going to say where it happened in the most extreme measures. Not only does it have extreme temperatures, it has an extreme property market that yeah. does amazing things. We're going to go have a look at the bottom, the top, and then the yeah. bottom again. So, folks, if you if you have any slight interest in property whatsoever, you don't want to miss this episode. Yeah, it's a ripper. because. I've got to tell you, our guest, um, Rick, I'll introduce him when we cut to it shortly, um, but was very transparent, mm. very mm. transparent. So in terms of pre, during, after, and some of the carnage that happened after yeah. as well. So and, the, and unfortunately, some of the horror stories and yeah. sad stories that came about, uh, you know, what, what people did at that time. Mm. Yeah, so um, so uh, stick around, folks. That is going to be great. We'll cut to that shortly. But I just want to let you know that we were speaking to Rick um, up in the north of Western Australia, yep. uh, there in Port Hedland, um, and he was talking to us uh, via Zoom so we could see him. It was on the mobile Pilbara. phone. So the audio jumps in and out in certain parts, but for 95% of the um, interview, it's no problem there. So yep. just please indulge us that. But before we go into it, here's my mindset minute today, Ben, and it's a very, very straightforward one. Life is inherently risky, Ben. Mm -hmm. There's also only one big risk you should avoid at all costs, and that is the risk of doing nothing, Bryce. You hadn't even read my notes. I'm impressed. Nothing. That was Dennis Waitley. Now, Dennis Waitley was one of those um, self-help gurus back in the days when I first picked up the the Zig Ziglar and the Jim Rohn. Dennis Waitley was inside the mind of the athletes and all that sort of stuff. But Dennis says, life is inherently risky. There is only one big risk. bench as well. You should avoid at all costs. And that is the risk of doing nothing. Now, I wanted to use that as a bit of a segue into today's chat that we have. (laughs) Why is Ivis laughing? (laughs) She loved one of your dad jokes. She was laughing at my dad joke <laughs> off the bench. Well, don't, mind you, talk. Sorry, <laughs> pardon sorry, me talking while you two are interrupting. But uh, so we, we, I use that as a bit of a segue into today's um, chat because there is a bit of risk. Plenty of risk in today's chat. So let's cut to the interview t- that we have uh, with Rick Hockey. All right, today, Ben, we've got a very special guest. We have Rick Hockey, who's an award-winning real estate agent specialising in the Pilbara in the far north of far Western north. Australia. WA. Uh, Port Hedland, South Hedland, Newman, and the Marble Bar area. Um, he's also a senior sales consultant at First National Hedland. Uh, Rick has a three-decade connection with Hedland's property market and is a proven uh, real estate agent has developed from rookie to diamond achiever um, with uh, numerous awards to date. Um, but Rick and his wife, Bev, have made Port Hedland home in 1980, Ben. Wow. Uh, loving the opportunities, lifestyle, and raising their three children there. Welcome to the Property Couch, Rick. Thank you very much, boys. Fantastic. Um, yeah, all the way you from now, Albany's. You can now officially be called a local. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a sort of, Mate, it's been a long time up there. How I sometimes I sometimes use that line myself, but yeah, it's great. It's been um, ever since we myself and Beverly got up here. It's been a great place, very good for our family. Rick, how old were you? you went back in 1980 when you moved up there. 21, and had a, had a little bit more hair than what I've got now. <laughs> <laughs> On a podcast, people can't quite catch that. But um, the the uh, what's interesting is what where, where were you when you were 20, and then you decided I'm I'm going to head up north to to the Pilbara. Okay, I was in Albany and um, my father had a, 
a butcher shop and I was an apprentice there. So I did butchering for six years, got kicked out of school fairly early. Um, so worked in that butcher shop and then I thought, well, um, I need to get out and I need to have a look, see what else is around there. I was going to go and play football in the Bendigo League and I don't know why because I don't like the cold. But we ended up having a friend who was on holidays down from Port Hedland, a family friend, and he met my father at the pub and he said, what's your young fella up to? And he said, he's going to go and play footy. He said, no, why doesn't he come up to Port Hedland, play one season of footy, and then he can go around Australia? So we changed all of our plans around. I guess it was just the climate and the heat. As I say, I don't like the cold. And that sort of turned everything around and our first stop was Port Hedland and we've been here ever since. <laughs> Never left. And did you play that footy season out? Did you? I certainly did. I played the footy season out, become a life member of the club, the association. My wife's you're a, a triple life premiership member. coach from my reading. Yeah, yeah. So that's been really good and successful. I've really enjoyed the football up here. It's been fantastic. Very good. Well, you're playing in good sunny conditions most of the time of the year, so yeah, it sounds like it would be a nice place to play footy. Hey, Rick, let's set the scene for uh, for our listeners who have never been to the Pilbara. I have, uh, mm-hmm. Ben has, but yep. uh, for those who haven't, let's let's just paint a picture for the lifestyle that's on offer for a 21 year old who turns up there and thinks uh, I might go around Australia and you never leave. What what was it about the lifestyle that was on offer, and how, how would you describe it to someone who's never been there? Uh, what enticed me was just shorts and thongs and that was about it, that you could uh, come up into the Pilbara. The, I guess the second big thing was there wasn't a lot put on for you, so go to the cinemas if you're in Perth or Albany and all that. You had to make your own fun. So that involved a lot of camping, fishing, crabbing, skiing. So you're always out doing something. On the weekends, there was always a party or a barbecue or something. So it was that outdoor life and the good living of being able to walk around, whether it be winter or summer, uh, in, in a pair of shorts and thongs. Yeah, so, so big mining community, but can you just share with us sort of a, a, a bit of the economics in the area? So what sort of mining have you got going up there? Uh, population, um, all of those types of sort of big numbers so people get a sense of the, the location. We've currently got about 13,500 people in Port Hedland. At the height of the boom a few years back, we're talking about eight, ten years back, there was about 20,000 people here. Um, it's mainly revolving around iron ore and there's you know, half a dozen iron ore companies who come through Hedland, but there's also lithium that's just come on board. There's also magnesium and there's also salt that's been around for a long time. So a lot of natural resources very close to Headland. We have a a natural inner harbour and uh, that brings a lot of trade winds to us as well. So it really is, I guess, uh, Newman where the mine is, that's for about 400 odd kilometres by railway line to Headland. We're the shipping. We just ship it all out. you know, import, export type stuff. All trains lead to you, don't they? So they can get it up to China. Yeah, look, we, you know, we, China, um, Japan's still a big client um, and many other places overseas that we go to. And we can see down the track, we might be adding to that, you know, there's massive amounts of gas reserves. There's only about 150 kilometres off Port Hedland's coast. Uh, and we're well set up to, to handle that. So, and that's massive reserves they're talking about. Hey, Rick, you turn up as a 21-year-old. You, d- you left Albany. For those people who don't know where Albany is, it's the far south of Western Australia. You've headed straight up to the north of Western Australia. You land there as a 21-year-old. You're about to kick a footy around in the team there. What, what, what did you do for work? Because you're one of the areas, uh, if not number one, you're close to it, um, sales agents. But there was a there was a bit of a run-up between a 21-year-old footballer running around to where you are now. What, what did the career path look like? I guess um, when I got up here, I got several different jobs um, just to sort of keep me going. Um, and that was labouring, you know, out, um, I remember for the gas, and that was in Crafter, cleaning out pipes out at Brambles and stuff like that, digging holes in the hard pin dam that's out there, which was bloody hard work. But um, eventually I put in for BHP because I thought, no, nah, I like this place, I want to stick around. BHP knocked me back to get in. It was really easy to get into BHP, but I got knocked back twice before, <laughs> I got, before I got in there. And I guess the reason was they knew that I was up here for one season and I was going to keep travelling. 
I eventually convinced them, got into BHP, and I, I worked for 28 years at BHP, uh, and that was really exciting, and, and I loved working there. D doing what in particular, Rick? I started off as a, a TA, so a trades assistant, um, and then I slowly worked myself up. I worked in quality control. I ended up being a supervisor in mechanical. I also looked after all the conveyor belts. I managed all the conveyor belts on Cook Point and Finnegan Island. Okay, nice. So, so, so how, do you, how do you transition to where you are now? How, how did you pivot into property? Okay, a little bit of a funny story there. While I was at BHP, I had a cleaning company that I started and I used to go out, had about five or six contracts to clean different places. One of those um, was Headland First National and while I, whilst I was building a property portfolio, I was buying property through Headland First National, but I also had the cleaning contract. So the licensee said one time, you know, you spend that much time in here, you should be really working here. <laughs> and I thought about that and a couple of weeks later, um, bumped into Morag again and she said, did you ever think about what I said? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. She told me, I guess the, the sort of lifestyle is a bit different being a real estate agent to being in a BHP where you must wear fluoro colours and you must do <laughs> presentations this way and you must do that. There were... The creativity wasn't there for me and real estate really did appeal to me but also I guess it can be financially rewarding too because it's a, the harder you work, the more you can get out of it. At BHP, I could work you know, 16 hours but still get paid for eight hours. Yeah, okay. So you just hinted there that you had a couple of properties before you, you got into real estate. What, what um, got you into property investing in the first instance? Um, what was your sort of money story? Obviously, when you're working in the mines, you're earning a lot of money, but people don't realise the cost of living is a little bit higher up there. So tell us a bit about that backstory in terms of what got you into buying properties and, and sort of also led into your uh, real estate career. I guess um, when I was down in Albany, my parents were a bit worried about me, how I was going to get on because I didn't do well at school. Um, mm -hmm. So they encouraged me to buy a vacant block of land so I could build a house and then live happily ever after in Albany. Um, and I bought that block of land. Uh, but when I got up in the headland and realised I wasn't going to be he heading back, I sold that and bought um, a property in Perth. Um, and then I continued to invest in Port Headland where I started accumulating and I guess as the market was inching its way up, I, I would get equity within properties that I had and then I would invest again out of that, which is a you know, commonly known strategy, uh, but something I'd be very careful about now. Who, who was your, like, what, what was the vision back then? So obviously sold the land, bought the, was there someone who you were following? Who, who, was, who was paving the path before you that you were trying to emulate? Um, at that early stage, uh, when I first started off, there wasn't anyone. Um, I guess it was just common sense coming from mum and dad. Yeah. Um, but as I got into it a bit more and I, I, I started to love property, I started uh, going to property um, seminars, reading all the books and that. I had one thing in my mind that I, I didn't want to be a nobody. I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to have a, a house or a couple of houses. And, and live a life that I really wanted to, not having to worry about money. So, so that's a good point. Did you have to worry about money in your household as you were growing up? What were some of the money habits that you, you picked up from your folks? And it sounds like um, you wanted to pivot towards really good money management. Was that, was that something that you picked up from the parents or was it uh, something that you had to change? Uh, look, mum and dad were, um, had, I had a pretty good, bringing but there wasn't lots and lots of money there whilst we did have a good butcher shop there um eventually all that sort of money went when mum and dad um got out of the butchering trade and retired and that i guess it was seeing that and saying well mum and dad now live off the government i didn't want to be that um so i thought there must be another way and that's when i went searching i guess it was just in my own head saying I've seen what mum and dad have done. I need to go another step. Yeah, nice. So obviously, Rick, you, you understand that the yields are pretty terrific in places like Port Hedland for, for most of the, the journey. And then, you know, the, a timing of an economic cycle 
or in our case, uh, you know, sort of maybe once in a lifetime or at least once in every 50 year mining boom that came through there. So when you were going to those educational seminars and alike, were you, um, what, were, what sort of some of the takeaways you were getting from that? Because obviously we all know what happened post mining boom, but were the spruikers really focusing in on the mining towns or were they also talking about, um, you know, big cities like Perth or even exploring any of the eastern states? Oh, look, we had spruikers and that, that, that came through and, you know, they, they did their thing. I guess I was mainly interested in, in Port Hedland um, being home, but I also had a bit of property in Perth, uh, um, had um, a little bit in New South Wales, Darwin uh, and Broome and... and but, I would say 80% of it was in, in Port Hedland. And I guess being home and having the high cash flow from properties when things were booming was very attractive to um, get more property and keep on going. But all of that had its downside too, a um, little bit blindsided and that in a bubble um, as the property continued to grow in value and the cash flow was coming up. It was quite enormous, you know, six, seven, eight hundred grand's worth of cash flow coming through at one stage. And I'm thinking, wow, this is okay. But, you know, nothing lasts forever. And that's just one of the things that I've learned, you know. Yeah. So, so you didn't see that, I mean, you know, a lot of the, the spruikers who were spruiking some of the mining town areas at the time were saying that it was an evergreen event, you know, like mining was going to boom indefinitely. Um, we were going to get $2,500 a week rent every week for our four-bedroom uh, houses in locations like that. Um, was, 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 it, was it because everyone was basically supporting each other that this over-exuberance occurred? Were there any naysayers or people who were sort of saying, you know, can it go on forever or were you listening to that noise or what was the story there? No, look, um, we weren't. Once you're in that bubble, it was pretty hard to stop because there was nothing but good news coming out of the mining sector for, for a long time there. And, you know, we, we took six or seven years that it started. Um, and uh, the, even myself being in the real estate game and that got caught up in that. And I did have once, I remember, you know, I had a mate from Perth come up, uh, Rob Druitt, very, uh, quite big in the, the Perth. Uh, real estate industry and that, and he had a look around. He was going to do an investment. He said, you know, you know what? He said, this can't, this can't keep going on. And I thought to myself, well, oh, geez, he doesn't know much, does he? You know, <laughs> he's come, come up from Perth. It doesn't look like I'm going to get him to buy a property. But he was, he was spot on. He saw that, you know, things that increased so far, what goes up must come down. And that's exactly what happened probably about 12 to 18 months after he left. We started to see things come down. But look, most people in town, very upbeat. Everybody was doing well, cash flow for everyone, businesses, investors. Um, we had a lot of investors that were all over Australia and in, international. Um, so it, it was pretty full on and it wasn't till we started to see things to slow down that everybody's going, what is happening? Mm. Take us into the thick of it, Rick. You know, rewind to the early days. What, what, did, it, what did it look like for you on the... The selling side during that time was it days on market would be yeah. almost it was like things press, were just snapping like yeah it would have been crazy press hard four copies um yeah give us give us some insights that people who aren't in your situation just just wouldn't be able to comprehend A booming market yeah yeah look it was booming and uh, there wasn't there didn't appear to be anything out there that would stop it um and i guess everything you know, uh, relies on supply and demand. We were, at, you know, bursting at the seams up here. There was a lot of construction work going on, so people were flooded into the town. There wasn't a lot of camps at that stage, which meant that our private sector got well and truly blown out. So we weren't uh, saying, um, you know, it's $1,000 per week for a house. It was based on the rooms. So it might be three or four hundred dollars per room, or six hundred dollars per room. Yeah. So we had the highest rental levels that we had. Before. We had three properties at Pretty Pool that were five thousand dollars each per week. Five um, each per wow. week, and, and that's how many bedrooms? Um, they had five. One had five. One, one had six. I had. 
I had two properties myself that were um, gaining $3,000 per week each and they were four by two bedroom houses. Yeah. Wow. I did a recce trip up that way. Uh, I did Broome and Derby at the time and at the time it was, it was 2400 for a four bedroom house and I was... I just kept scratching my head, but uh, yeah. So, so these properties were were basically were they being sold um, house and land packages off the plan? I mean, how often were properties staying on the market? And were were you know people was there more demand and supply? Naturally, there was on the tenancy side, but even in terms of investors and versus owner occupiers, what was the sort of blend of, of percentages of owner occupiers versus investors that you were seeing? Well, I, I just before I forget, I, I'll explain how we, um, you know, let's as an example say that we've got a property that's getting $3,000 per week. Um, how we would put a price on that would be um, cut that $3,000 in half. 50% is um, $1.5 million. So $1.5 million would be 10.4% return. Now, that's how, <laughs> that's how we would put basically... And people would say, well, where could you get that sort of return around in you know, Australia? And Yield. that was that was just a quick rule of thumb way that this house, that two thousand dollar house, is worth a million dollars, ten point four percent return. So we sold a lot of property. There's a lot of property bought by investors based around that ten, twelve percent return. Um, wow. So yeah, and, and you know that's that's not the right way to do it. But that's what, what happened. Let, let, let's build a picture for that because when I was up there, I was flabbergasted at like, because we're just talking, like, set the scene for that $3,000 house. It's just a steel constructed, standard yeah. three bedroom house on, on how much land? Uh, it could be anywhere between 500 square metres and 800 square metres. Yeah. And, and cycloned. So, in other words, and corrugated iron. People don't understand that they're all made out of basically blue, blue scope steel. And the roof, the roofing, the, the trusses, the amount of steel that I saw in the roof, the roofing was just like, are you serious? And that's where I couldn't get my head around it because, you know, we're land to asset ratio. So I, when I was doing the broom models, I was like, wait a minute, it's 280000 to build this steel home, but the land I'm getting is one hundred to 130000 for the land component. So it was in complete reverse. Normally I want 60% of the land to asset ratio in the land component and so I'm like trying to get my head around this in terms of wait a minute the house is worth more than the land but the, the house is what the, it was fascinating in terms of for someone coming from an eastern state mindset and uh, an investment theory yeah look um, I guess you look back and you say well how much would it be to build that that particular house and getting three three thousand dollars per week well maybe it cost about five hundred five hundred fifty thousand and and chuck the land on and you think well where did the 1.5 million come a lot of it was based around that return yeah. and stuff like that but you know uh, everybody got um got drawn into that value as banks you know banks were were borrowing the money uh, no problems mm -hmm. at all but of course um it didn't last forever and then we started to see things settle down with iron ore prices, construction started to finish and, and the whole market changed, which a lot of us thought, what is happening? This you know, property doesn't go down. Well, it does go down. So, so start stepping us through that. The peak, at the peak of your um, portfolio story, it's generating you know, in excess of six to $800,000 in surplus cash flow. Um, I remember uh, the gentleman that I spent time in Broome with, his uh, rent roll was a million dollars a year in his portfolio in Broome and Derby. Um, so take us through what that started looking like. Obviously, the workforce was leaving the town, vacancy rates are going up. So sort of step us through the program and how quickly that transpired to a point where, where it sort of bottomed out. Yeah, look, the... Um Downturn started about mid-2012, uh, near the end, end, between mid and end of the year, and we noticed a couple of things that happened. The iron ore price, which is up around $180 per tonne, started to slide, um, and also construction work around town started to finish up. So we had people um, that, that were local in town, even fly in, fly out, stuff like that, started to leave. 
Now, the iron ore price went from $180 per tonne right down to $30 per tonne. So it's a massive drop. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and followed by that with uh, all the construction finishing up, we went from 20,000 people down to 13,000 people. So that all of a sudden completely changed. Um, you get up one morning and all of a sudden there's 13 kilometres between Port and South Headland now during the boom, you would drive that and you would have to be looking out left, right and centre. There's cars, trucks everywhere. But then you get up one morning, you're driving to South Head and you say, where are all the cars? What's happened with all the cars? Oh, there's one. So it was a big change. So many people leaving town. Businesses really did start to struggle. So they had to cut back. There was a lot of businesses that went broke. And all, all of a sudden, we saw that transpire into residential, commercial properties um, where people could sustain the, the money that they borrowed because they're getting $3,000 per week, but now they weren't getting that. It went down to 2000 It went down to 1000 All of a sudden, you know, people are in a bit of strife with cash flow. Mm. What, um, did, what was your observations of the people that were um, getting the, 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 these, um, you said 600 to 800 someone's a million, were your observations with people spending that on lifestyle or did you see some people retiring out some debt and who actually still have some form of um, uh, legacy of that time rather than sort of getting out there, spending their money and still coming out really poorly? Yeah, look, there, there was people out there who, you know, getting that equity and they were buying some things on lifestyle. There's, there's no doubt about that some were reinvesting and, of course, their mortgage, uh, their debt went levels went high. Um, and there were some people out there who were, were reducing as well. Obviously, the smart ones were reducing debt as, as they went and they were probably, there was a low percentage of those ones and they were the ones who managed to come out the other end, but the ones who spent on lifestyle and continued to increase their debt because... The strategy in those days, and there was a lot of spookers around people and books and that that would say, you know, property continues to go up, so you keep buying, and you wait until you get your equity, you keep buying another property, keep buying. But what happens if that property starts to come down? And that's where we got smashed in a lot of Australia, I guess, um, not knowing intimately the rest of it, but I know enough to know there's a lot of people around Australia who have been, you know, hurt by the prices coming back so it was those ones who thought that it would never end um and that property prices don't come, pull back every now and then that, that really got hurt and a lot of people lost everything so rick this happens over a sort of a nine month to 12 month period it moves pretty quickly doesn't it we move from a booming to a to a busting economy put your uh, real estate hat back on for us and now you're getting the calls from these owners who are like, should I sell? Um, can you get me a tenant? You, you know, the panic is starting to set in. And, you know, what's your message to those people? Because it's like, you know, how long is this going to bottom out? Is it going to get better again? I mean, it was, it was such a, a, a phenomenal boom um, that not really too many people can look into their crystal ball to sort of say when it was going to recover. Um, we know that there's definitely some green shoots and recovery happening now, but at the time, take us through those phone calls or take us through yes. what a typical day looked like when, when basically... When the all, panic set in. <laughs> all, I've, all, all I've got a vision of is basically the Wall Street, you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange where people have got their hands in their heads and their phones are going nuts and people are screwed. What was it like, um, you know, being at the coalface? Yeah, blood on the streets. Um, look... It is very hard. It's probably, it's not probably, definitely um, the hardest time of my life, but not only me, everyone who is in the, the real estate industry now, you've got your property managers who have to deal, you know, with the owners of properties and how come you can't get $2,000 per week? You can only get 1500 I have to have $2,000 per week to keep everything going. Yeah. So it was very, very stressful for the girls. For me, taking phone calls as a sales agent, they had to sell, but they had to sell at a certain price. Well, we can't sell for a million now. We can only get, you know, 500 and then 300 and sometimes 250 So it was like it must stop now. When we started to see things come down, the 
the mentality out there for everyone, including myself, is that it's got to stop soon. It can't go too much further down. Well, our, you know, in a normal market, you can come down about 10%. If you, come, if you drop back 20%, it's quite huge. We went 30%. We went 40, 50, 60, 70, between 70 and 80%. Wow. Is the pullback that we had in for Headland in both rentals yeah. and in both sale prices. It was one hell of a, a double whammy. Um, really knocked the town for six. Um, and the mindset is you can't keep going, you can't keep going. But you've got to have a look at what's happening out there. And with so many people, you know, with supply and demand, so many people leaving town. And I guess you try and look for the dynamics of the town and try and read into that prior to it happening and say, well, this doesn't feel good, I'm going to get out. Being able to do that is, you know, is just absolutely magic. Um, I, I wish I had woken up, you know, to that myself because I had over 20-odd properties floating around. Now, I did eventually uh, get to a stage where I said, I've got to do something. I've got to take action or I'm going to lose the whole lot. Now... A very small minority of people did it earlier than me. There's another small minority who did it around the same time me and managed to save themselves. There's a very large minority who were stuck in with that fear and they didn't take action and they didn't do anything. And unfortunately, you know, um, it's pretty hard. You try to get to sleep tonight, at night, um, you're walking around every day, you've got your kids and your family sort of, uh, you know, how do you approach them and say, I've lost everything, um, yeah. you know, after they've had a pretty good life. So pretty stressful times for people who were ringing me and I know what they were going through um, because I was in the same position. So very, very hard times. Small community too, right? So you, you know, not like in the big smoke where, you know, a real estate agent can do a transaction with a total stranger and at the end of the deal they remain total strangers. I'm, I'd imagine for you there was a fair bit of relationship that remained, whether it was the footy club or seeing them around town. And so to be going through it yourself, to maybe have been the person who sold a property at a higher level and then it's dropping off and then to see them affected, um, you, you know, your networks and your friendship circles as well, that... That all conspires to, to sort of help describe what you're saying was a, was a really tough time for you. It was pretty horrific. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, when we had the boom going, a lot of our buyer clients were from out of town who become seller clients. And there were people that are local um, that did buy and exactly like that and a couple tied up in the footy club. I, I guess the hardest, yeah, that was very hard. And, and, you know, one time I was in somebody's house out in South Headland and it was, it was a lovely couple around their 60, 65, and they were getting ready for retirement. The only reason they had bought that property for 700000 was so they could stay up. They didn't want to do flying flat. He wanted his wife to be in Headland. And he bought it for that reason said, well, when we're ready, I'll just sell it. I don't care if I make money, I'll sell it. You know, I stood in the lounge room. I had to tell them that it was only worth two hundred and fifty thousand. They'd lost all their savings. They couldn't yeah. retire, and things like that, stories like that, were really, really tough. And I walked out there and sat in my car, and I thought, "Geez, you know, it just rips you apart." And for eighteen months, I got absolutely lost myself. And I thought, "How do I sell property in a market like this? Um, how do you face up to people?" So a lot of challenges. Um, but I'm glad I, I found a way and I, I asked for some help um, from some very good people and, you know, found my way out of that to be able to recover. What, what, was, their, what was their message to you, Rick? Because I, I can't, I honestly can understand what you're saying, but I can't imagine what it felt like. So what, what were some of the messages to help you get through that? Because, I mean, you're just, just trying to earn a living and help su surround yourself with good people and around your family. So you didn't, you didn't cause the boom or the bust, but... Um, yeah, what, what, what sort of messages helped you get through that? Yeah, look, I guess I had the double whammy where, you know, I was right in the middle of the real estate agency, so all of a sudden I was, I was quite a successful real estate agent and all of a sudden I'm struggling to list and sell property. So my income dropped away. My big portfolio of property all of a sudden cut in half and cut in half again. So it, it was really... It was really hard and I got to that stage of saying, well, if I don't take action, if I don't do something, you know, the whole lot goes. So I rang a couple of people that I knew in the industry and also a couple
couple of people who I didn't know, but I heard were good people. And I talked to them, uh, a couple of them real estate agents, um, and they were selling in really tough markets. All right, you can do it. I can do it. Tell me what you're doing. I, I ended up getting a mentor um, and uh, I'm still working with that mentor today who sort of turned me around, kicked me in the ass and said, stop feeling sorry for yourself and everybody else and, and you know, um, care but don't, don't care too much. You've got a job to do now. Get out there and do it because these people still need their properties listed and sold and uh, I guess that was the biggest thing is knowing that somebody else was out there. You know, if you need help, you got to ask for it, um, and and that's what got me kick started. And once I got once I got uh, up and running, you know, I, I just felt unstoppable. How the hell do you come back from something like that? It just gave me a lot of confidence to to keep going, getting better and better. Do you so, have oh, do you have a do you have a um, a memory of a a peak to trough of a particular transaction that you did? So. Hey, at one stage I sold this for one and a half and then I had to sell it for, you know, you use anecdotes. Was it as high as that? One and a half went down to 250 or was it even higher? Can I jump in there? Because that's exactly what I was going to run up. Going to so pre-boom, so pre-boom, what was a typical four better median house price four better worth in Port Headlands before the boom? Oh, well, look, there's Port and South and there's a bit of a difference there, but... Um Let's go for the top, which is Port. Not South is a little bit cheaper, isn't it? So, so Port Hedland, near yeah. where all the action is and the township is, a typical four better pre the um, pre the mining boom. What was it? What was it? Yeah, spelled? look, go back sixteen years ago, um, pre boom, and you know, three, three or four hundred thousand dollars. So three, three to four hundred thousand peak of the market. Oh, what sort of rent were we getting at that time um, for that four better? Oh. You know, Just probably uh, probably around the four hundred. Um, yeah, so dollar per know. thousand. Yep, dollar per thousand. Then, yeah. as Bryce was asking, at the peak of the market, what was that for better worth um, in terms of value? And we heard the rent, probably around that three thousand dollar mark. But is that is that about right? And what sort of what was the best price you got for a typical four bedroom steel home? Yeah, look, they all vary, and that you know they're out in pretty pool or they're in in town and that. Um, but I guess if you just want to average it out, um, you know, around the 1.2, 1.3 million. Yep. And the rents we were getting on that at the peak were about three two, thousand. Two, two and, and a half thousand two just half. on this average. Yep. Okay. So two and a half thousand per 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 week. And where did Unbelievable. And then you bottomed out. So you're bottoming out around the two fifty for the houses. To 300? Uh, look, we've basically, where we are now, we've gone back to 16 years. So we've gone back 16, 17 years. The three, so, the three yeah, to four. Yeah, but at right the very bottom, we were talking, some of those were selling for about 250 in terms of what that looks like. So if that's not an indication of supply and demand and over exuberance, I don't think there, and what sort of rent are we getting these days? We are getting a little bit more than dollar per thousand though, aren't we, in Port Hedlands? Oh, uh, look, we're just in the um, early, well, we're in the stages of recovery now, so our rents just started climbing again. So, you know, we've got a couple of houses out at Prepool that um, have climbed back up to about, you know, between $1,000 dollars $1, per wow. week. Um, that's for the nicer type properties in the nicer area. So they're still, that, that, that's, a, that's a healthy yield. That's, yeah. that's getting right up there. That's nine plus, even double digits if we're sort of, if the valuations of those homes are, Sitting around four hundred. Yeah, I guess. Um, I guess one thing that sticks in my mind was um, at the height of it was on a Saturday morning. Um, I went up to Sutherland Street and uh, I had a property up there that um, I, I had a buyer for. So I went up there. It was uh, a three three by one. Look, the house itself, nothing special. It was on about nine hundred square meters, but complete yeah. ocean views. So I walked into that probably around nine o'clock, and that um, and um, I managed to get a a buyer at 2.2 million for that property, and as I was walking back out of the that property, I was walking out of. Now the reason that was is because it's an R80 zoning, so it's for a development. Yeah. So it was a development company who had bought it. As I was walking out of the property, I looked over to the right and I saw um, this couple that was sitting on their front veranda and they're having a cup of tea and sort of. I'll well, give them a bit of a wave and that, and they said, oh, what are you up to? So I said, oh, I'll come over and have a chat. So 
we went next door, had a chat, and so I just sold the property or put it under offer at 2.2 million. And they said, oh, Jesus, do you think you get that for hours? And I said, yeah, I do. I said, let me make a phone call. So I walked around their front yard. I rang that same development company and those both those properties went for 2.2 million each wow. that morning. Wow, that was that was that was worth your effort that morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a nice cup of tea. It was a pretty it was a pretty good morning. And and in terms of yeah, they are fast track. What what did did they resell from that development company? Did they ever develop on it or? Yeah, I've just sold. No, they didn't develop on it. Um, I've just sold those properties, and they sold roughly about eighteen months ago uh, for between five and five hundred and fifty thousand each. <laughs> Wow. wow! No, that's crazy. So, hey, yeah. yes, incredible. So, so that just gives our listeners a, a, a bit of an insight into what that looks like. I, I'm interested in um, how you talked about. There was a lot of inter, like interstate or even Perth-based buyers. How were they buying? Were they flying in and out, or were they buying sight unseen? A lot were sight unseen. So, I guess what that all revolved around was you'd get a phone call from someone interstate and they would be saying, look, interested in that property, can you send me the lease details, um, some more photos of it, uh, some outgoings, and they would come back and be bought along that. There were some who would fly in and they'd have a look at the properties, a bit of a drive around, but there was a lot just sold um, over the phone um, by email and that. Yeah, How long so. between the listing going on the portals and you getting that phone call and selling? Are we, are we hours? Oh, look, it, it, it depends. No, not hours. It, it would depend. Sometimes we would. We'd get a phone call straight away. But some would be days, weeks, months. Yeah. Um, but generally within the two months that we'd list a property, um, then we would have it sold. Uh, yeah, it was... It was basically around what's the condition of the property. There was a price that people wanted to jump in, price limits and stuff like that. But look, it revolved around what what sort of a return am I going to get and is that house potentially got good uh, growth in its rental? So, Rick, the people who were buying sight unseen versus the people who did make the effort to go up there and have a look, what was the conversion rate like on both of those? Were the people who were buying sight unseen more likely to buy than the people who went up there and thought, wow, it really is remote. It really is. Did that, did they have a little bit more uh, convincing that it was a breath? You yeah, know, <laughs> because I mean, I remember when I flew into Broome and I went up to Derby, I'm like, Derby is not even a town, right? You know, the, the, the dress shop was out of a 44 foot container on the main street. So it's a different type of experience. And, and that through me as an experienced investor, but, was there any sort of difference in terms of their mindset when they were buying? Oh, look, not, not really. When people came to town, that they could see the enormity of uh, what was happening within and the harbour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. when, when we were, you know, we had uh, half a dozen uh, wharfs and stuff there that were loading iron ore and that, but were saying, oh, look, there's going to be another three wharfs going to be built. Um, and we always had a pretty good story as there was because there was so much happening. Um, with the iron ore companies out there, you know, we had FMG come on board. Then we had Roy Hill come on board. So mm. there's always a good story. Hey, things are going to continue to grow. And yeah. look, they did um, for that six or seven years. It was it was very very busy, and all that did happen. But there was an eventual pullback. Yep. Hey, one more question for me on the mechanics, and then we'll uh, we'll pivot to some of the sort of rear vision mirror stuff. But um, valuers, when when you were 3,000 rent, cutting it at half, 1,500, then put 1. it on for 1.5 million. <laughs> was there a valuer involved in this equation or did the banks just take contract price? <laughs> oh, no, valuers were, were always involved in the process, you know, as the banks were too, to lend the money out. But uh, it, it, the process of buying property is no different to what it is today. Okay. It's just that they, they, they could comp it up. They last week one sold for 1.5 million. Ten days ago, one sold for one and a half. There's another one on the market for one and a half. So I guess it's just stock standard comp sales, right? I guess there was evidence out there to say, hey, this has previously happened as the market continued to creep up. Um, yeah, there was evidence there that, hey, previous similar type houses had had sold for that. So, Rick, I, I think it's let's round out the, the, the market update of the mining areas that are Port Hedland and those areas. Um, where are we today? So you, you have talked about that we're 
out the other side of that. Tell us a little bit about the market today and, and is there opportunity? And I suppose that then is a nice little segue into some of the lessons that you've learned that you'd like to share with other potential buyers and investors um, that, that there's a legacy that, you know, basically won't see them, you know, make any of those mistakes. Look, the market now um, has well and truly settled down. Uh, there's no more downward pressure on either the sales or the rentals. Uh, so that's a good thing. In fact, the rentals are the first thing that they've um, found strength. So over the last six to eight months, we've we've actually had a, a, an increase in the weekly increase of between fifty and a hundred dollars. So when um, leases have been coming, when leases have been coming up for renewal on that, then we've been getting the extra fifty to a hundred dollars per week for that. So that's starting to find some strength uh, again, supply and demand. There hasn't been anything new or big start around town, but simply the mining companies are now spending more on productivity within the inner harbour and within their own mining um, structures and that. So we've had lithium come on board. We've had cattle come back in. So we have had other little winds around the place and quite a few little winds that haven't been enormous but enough of them to make a difference to our town. We have a lot of other big exciting things that are happening with oil and gas and all that sort of stuff just off our coast but we do see that there will be some um, significant things coming coming up within the next six to 12 months that will probably kick us along even more than where we are now but definitely in recovery mode there's no doubt about it so uh, I guess if you were advising uh, someone now to say okay I encourage you to buy into um, the, your area. What, what are some of the cautionary tales that you give them so that they can make good buying decisions rather than some of the, the, the carnage decisions you've seen in the past? Yeah, look, I think um, go for two things rather than just your, your cash flow and stuff like that. Have a look at the capital growth potential because in this market now you have very a very good opportunity to get cash flow or at least that investment will pay for itself. Look, the market was very abnormal when it was so high in the boom days. The market to me now is still abnormal because it's well and everything that I sell is well and truly below replacement costs. So when a normal market comes around, we're floating around replacement costs. So we're going to see some, in my opinion, some good capital growth and we're starting to see that the first thing in a market will always go will be the rentals will start to either go up or down. Now it's happened with us, you know, time and time again here. Yeah. We start the rentals have already taken off; they're starting to move up. Um, I What's would say the next rate six the months. What's your uh, I think rate? it's around um, three, three to four percent. Okay, so still a, a still a bit of stock around, but but it, the good stock's moving, and hence the rents are going up for the businesses. Well. well to put a comparison in, we've got about 90 properties out there that we can lease out at the moment. If okay. we go back four years, there was 450 properties wow. that were available for lease. And okay. so definitely there's been a swing and a change in the market, but with some other things coming out in the next six, 12 months, I think that we're going to get another couple more shots, shots in the arm. Okay. Okay. So your perspective on investing, Rick, are you, are you still, is property still a vehicle for you in your future or has is, is this rattled you at all or has it just sharpened up your, um, your focus? Rattled the hell out of me when uh, I thought I was going to lose everything, you know, uh, being the astute investor and everything that I thought I was and I wasn't. I've learnt a lot out of it and, yes, I have. I've just dipped back into the market um, only about three months ago because I believe now is just the perfect time. So I bought two, two properties uh, that, that are local in town and the reason I bought them is that I think there's good... The, the market is perfect for some rental growth and definitely some capital growth of where we're going. There's nothing that's going to change that over the next few years to me because nobody is building new property out there. So what we've got is what we've got and we're going to continue, the mining companies are going to continue to grow and there will be new industries coming to town. Oh, I think that's well said. I think Very good. Thank you. You're, yes. one, you're one of the uh, the leading agents in the area. Do you think that uh, your experience helps you sort of empathise with, um, with your 
with your vendors because you're clearly listing and selling a lot of stuff. So I'm sure the fact that you've been there for 30 years, you're a local and you've been through some of this might help you out, does it? Yeah, look, definitely. Um, everything I do because my whole family's grown up here. We've got three kids and that. So I need to make sure that I'm being real genuine, honest, upfront with everything I do, dealings. A lot of our sales over the last few years have gone to our locals in town, which is fantastic because they can now afford it. The market has come right back. So it has changed the dynamics of the town, but I think change the dynamics very much for the better and moving forward, I think that we will not have boom and bust. We're going to have a strong market, but I think the infrastructure has changed because we do have camps and that can facilitate some fly in, fly out. So I think where we are now, the market's going to be much better going forward. You know, won't be the booms, but there won't be the horrible bus and everybody going broke that we had before. But, yeah, very good. Oh, well, firstly, Rick, thank you very much for sharing that. It's an honest story. Um, yeah. It's a story of uh, a time. It's a story of a mindset that, uh, that happened during that period where everyone was drinking from the same bathwater. You know, there, there was certainly... Um, a, a situation where the over exuberance kicked in and, and it was like it was never going to end. Um, so sharing that story will be a reminder for all of our listeners that property doesn't always go up, as Rick said so so well. Um, it, it does go down. There are risks. Uh, there is traditionally more volatility in our mining town areas. So timing the market in those particular areas is always uh, important looking at those fundamental drivers of demand and supply as we're talking about. And one of the lead indicators uh, Rick has just mentioned in around, you know, uh, yields moving. And then usually that's when the investor who's looking for yield plays uh, starts to, uh, to get a sniff of an opportunity. So please do your homework. Uh, it's not for everyone. No. It is a little bit more white knuckle territory for some. Um, but if you, if, you, if you do your homework, you speak to agents like Rick in the area who can give you an honest assessment and put you know, the right foot and the left foot um, in terms of what's, what's the, the upside and what's the downside, and then you can make a more informed decision. But please, please do your research because um, this area can be your make or break uh, to anyone's household financial story. As we heard from that couple who bought that property for $700,000 and, uh, and unfortunately their property in South Headland was, was going to basically be worth what it was at that time. So. Um, Thank you for that, uh, yeah, Rick. that that reminder, Rick, and for sharing your story. Hey, Rick, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, what I have noticed, uh, you know, you're you're a ripper bloke too. So you must be a Docker supporter, right? Oh, you know I'm not. Why did you bring that up? <laughs> Tell me it's the West Coast. Oh, mate, the mighty West Coast. You know, we're oh. previous. Oh, last year. I, thought, lucky, I thought he was going to come and trump and go to pies. Lucky, the lucky pies, I, I didn't ask that question at the top of the interview. That <laughs> That would have come of it. Nothing so. to see here. Thanks, Rick, for your time. Too. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's disappointing. But, uh, mate, uh, it, as Ben said, you've been really transparent. I think um, we're going to put your details in the show notes. So if anyone wants to reach out to you, I think um, they, if, the, if they're in your market, I think they'd be very smart to chat with you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on and, and teaching our audience what it's like to be in, in the thick of a boom and what it's like afterwards. So um, thanks for joining us on the couch. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, boys. And if uh, anybody can get anything out of that, or anyone wants to call me, always willing to. I fell, I, I fell into a few traps. So if I can help anyone else, you know, not fall into those same traps. It's it's worth it's worth a heap. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll send the doctor's membership to you now. But uh, thanks again <laughs> for joining us. Uh, we'll, we'll catch you. Good night, mate. Cheers. Well, Ben, that, that was just, look, you and I both commented after we stopped recording that uh, that could have gone for yep. a lot longer. I, I could spend half a day with Rick yeah. and learn a lot more about his marketplace and, you know, the mindset that he was in and, and you know, and how, how good is it that he's sharing that message for others Yeah. so they can listen yeah. to. But, but what a believable story because he's, he's, he was in the thick of it as a sales agent. Mm. He was in the thick of it as a property investor himself. <laughs> yes. He was in the thick of it of having to be a, a property counsellor on the expectations, back end. Yeah. Um, just had to go through a process of, of, his, of his own internal challenge. Yep. Um, I, just, I, was just amazed. I, I thought it would be a good interview, but I was, I was really amazed by the transparency. I, I reckon one of the reasons why he may have been able to get through it because it's very challenging. If you Imagine if you did all that for others but never took part yourself, right? Mm. He practiced what he preached. Mm. He did believe, mm. like everyone else who was caught up in the you know, over-exuberance that happens in a booming and bubbling market, 
Um, and when it popped, um, he also probably had that story as I, I can emphasize, you know, sort of emphasize and empathize with you is probably the word I was looking for. So I've got a bit of time if you need Thank to. you, I'll try again. <laughs> yeah, emphasize with you in terms of what that looks like. Em- yeah. Empathy, that's the word I'm looking for, isn't Which it? Which is what I didn't show you just then. <laughs> I didn't show you any empathy, but um, thank, you, thank, thank you, Rick, for, uh, for that. Yes. Oh, we enjoyed it and I hope, uh, hope you folks, uh, wherever you are running, on the train, driving home, wherever you are, you enjoyed that too. A couple of things, Ben, when we, uh, when we pushed stop on the interview, yes. we had a little bit of a uh, meeting after the meeting. And um, what was interesting was, um, uh, Rick said, what, what I probably would have done differently is make sure that I had a clear exit plan. Yeah. Because at the time I didn't have an exit plan. I was just buying, I was just buying, yeah. and I was getting caught up in the... Oh, how about a plan? Yeah. You know, which is what we've always said. So, I mean, for us it was reassuring. I mean, he bought, you know, as many as 20 properties in that market. So it's, it's really important that you plan to become what you plan to become. You work out what your plan is, and as part of that plan should be the exit. Are you le- is it legacy? Are you going to sell some of them down to pay debt off? So I, th- I think it rings really true. And what we've always said, you know, risky markets, you need to know what you're doing. It's like pro- property investing is like flying in a plane, Ben. I'm just mm-hmm. going to just come to me. Okay. Oh. You've got you, the flight attendant always lets you know where the exits are. Property investing is no different. You've oh, got to work out what it is. Hey? Round of applause. That hey, was good. Just, just oh, came just to came me. me. He's oh. on top of his game at the moment. I just feel the sincerity top is just oozing game. from you too, which is wonderful. Hey, um, my life hack today, Ben, is yes. when, when was the last movie that you went to? The actual cinema. Yes. Oh, oh. I hear the cogs turning. Yeah, can't even remember. What are we talking? Six months, twelve months, two, four oh, years? Oh no, probably in the last six months. I, maybe, but I can't remember. Where do you was. sit when you go to the cinema? Oh, uh, just probably three quarters up. Three quarters up. Yep. All right. Well, I want to help you, Ben, with your positioning. Cause okay. For the best sound experience in a movie theater, where do you think you should sit? In the middle. All right. Yep. Ivis. But I just don't she, want the she, neck, you know, I, that, that's I, the sore neck for bit. For those that playing I, at home, Ivis lipped, uh, what do you call it, um, mimed <laughs> the middle as well. She lipped it. So <laughs> so for the best sound experience in a movie theatre, you've got to sit two thirds of the way back and as close to the middle as possible oh. because this is where the audio engineer sits when they do the final mix. Two thirds back. You did not say, you I said did. halfway back. Oh. Well, uh, just above halfway back, two thirds back. Oh, you're just above halfway back now, <laughs> well, hey. Well, let's just, go. Do you want to add? No, replay did you do that in high school? Did replay you go back and add to your answer after you finished the replay exam? It. What did I say? Where did you think? What did you think I said? Did he say? Did he, yeah, he said three said, quarters? Did yeah. He? So three quarters from the back. Like, well, three quarters is seventy five percent. Two thirds is sixty six percent. He's clutching at straws now, like one row, two rows. It oh, could near be. enough is good enough for you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, folks. <laughs> For those of you that uh, oh, are happy playing with, along at home, if, if near enough is good enough, you sit wherever you want, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but for the rest of you, sit two thirds of the way back. Yeah, sorry, two for thirds. The best audio experience. <laughs> Three quarters. Ben, don't make it one row further, guys. Either way, it's brass on the edge. Did you know? <laughs> well, what I thought we'd do now that we're having such a great time. Um, so Rick obviously sells property in one of the hottest marketplaces in the world, and I mean hottest in regards to temperature. And uh, so Marble Bar, he mentioned Marble Bar and, and Newman and those areas up through there, Port Hedland, the whole area. Man, it can get hot in those particular locations. So, and I think it is, I think Marble Bar has the highest or hottest recorded temperature, you know, consistently, like it's got an average of 41 degrees or something year round, which is a bit crazy. So I thought what I'd do is I would just see what are the hottest places on earth. Oh. Okay, so um, I just went and Googled it, as you do. Uh, Death Valley yep. in California, in the USA, currently holds the record for the hottest air temperature ever recorded. The Desert Valley reached highs of 56.7 degrees in the summer, of 1913, uh, which is pretty pretty incredible. So average temperatures today reach 47 degrees during summer, so that's pretty warm. Yep. I reckon we've got a few places around Oz. Yeah, you can that, see what's called Death Valley. That does that for us in terms yep. of... Now, if you reckon I'm going to attempt no, this No, come second, on, if you don't get this Libya, right. Libya, everyone, this one's in Libya, if you need to know the name Azizia. of it. Azizia. Azizia. Azizia, yeah. thank you, Bryce, thank yeah. you for helping. Former capital of the... 
Jafari, Jafari, Jafari District, 25 miles. <laughs> okay, that one had 58 degrees. <laughs> Average temperature around 48 oh, degrees the third one be in easy to read. summer. No, it's not. It's oh, a hard one as well. No. Dalol. Yep. That'll do. We'll Pay try that. that one in Ethiopia. Yep. Yep. Um, so we also have very, very hot temperatures. Max recorded 41 degrees, 1960, 1966. <laughs> Come on. That was the average, yeah. remember? 41 degrees daily temperature Can't between 1960. And no, no, I said top three. Oh, I thought oh, you were going to number four. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. So oh. pretty, pretty hot places around yep. the world. Did you know? I mean, I we've gone on for that. long enough. Iris wants us to wrap it up. We're getting the whole wrap up here. I, I did not know that, mate. But uh, there you go, folks. Hopefully that was enjoyable. Hopefully uh, Ben's Did You Know uh, shows you some spots where you should avoid if you... Uh, Bryce is um, Bryce um, teaching us where we should sit <laughs> in regards to, you know, the, the sound engineering in the middle. What can Two I say? I'm, back, I'm here not, to serve. Three quarters up. My don't. role is to serve, Ben. My role is to serve. But uh, until next week. Well, before we go, I just also want to shout out, don't forget to grab the book. You yes. know, make money simple again. Where just you go, go ben, to that makemoneysimpleagain.com.au. Just right. go straight there, cut out all the noise, get your free book. Uh, and also don't forget that you've got the platform there as well, yep. um, which is also very helpful for you to organise your money, control it and thrive with your money management. But until next week, Bryce, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. There we go, folks. See you next week. Hey there folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the ABCD and so much more, and you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. And don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.